Hi everybody, welcome back to The Big Apple. My name is Dave Vellante. We are above the New York Stock Exchange trading floor, The Cube plus NYSE Wired Media Week. We're, this is our CXO series. We're talking to CIOs, which is both Chief Investment Officer and Chief Information Officer, CEOs, CFOs, Chief Security Officers, Chief Information Security Officers, all the C-suite is here, and we're psyched to have Mike Lyons, who's the CISO of Cribble. Mike, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Good to see you again. It's great it's to be here. It's been a long it time. Is, it has been a while, but it's great to be here. So we were talking, CISO or CISO? You're a CISO guy. I'm CISO all day long. So am I. CISO is just sounds like sizzle. You yeah, know, it's not the right. And you guys are like humble. You know? <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah, well, but you, can't, you can't share too much because <laughs> karma is a bad thing, right? And, uh, you win once and uh, the bad guys are out there. How, how are you doing? Um, how's things at Cribble? It, it is a, it's an amazing company. I, I feel like I'm in an opportunity um, where I'm just surrounded by some of the best people, best mindsets. And the company itself, I walk in and meet with our customers and they're so excited to hear from us. We are you know, just re reducing the amount of noise they have to deal with. They are they're very much focused on uh, logs. In my background, I got into security by being someone who's interested in logging before SIMs were invented and things like that, dating myself. And the customers that are looking at Cribble are saying like, hey, we can make our SIM much higher fidelity by leveraging this technology. Yeah, so we, we were talking off camera, I used the analogy of I got all these home apps, my Nest, my Ring, my this, my that, my that, my this. And, 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 I, and I mistakenly said, okay, you guys can help consolidate that. And you said, well, not quite. We actually feed data into a system from all these disparate you know, security tools. But then you said something that was really interesting to me that it's only the good data, not the noise, because I'm, I've, I've, I'm, I'm inundated with the haystack. So explain that. So a lot of what um, we help companies do is you know, we have data storage, we have data vessels, right? And uh, data lakes are terms and SIMs are terms, much more for security folks. And uh, we don't want a data swamp. Uh, it's not yeah, very useful. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like the notifications on my, uh, my device, your home security system can be a little swampy. And so what we can do is we can send the, the data that we have to have for reasons off to that location that I may use it for. But the data that I know I need quickly, fast, I put it in the best system and the one that I'm most focused on. Got it. What is the difference between being a CISO at a technology vendor versus um, a technology buyer? Well, I'm, I'm both. Um, in many ways, I'm both. I get the opportunity um, from having a, a working with a great company that I have other great companies come to us. I think a big difference uh, for me though is I don't get the opportunity to be wrong. Um, we're sort of immediately um, get, get feedback yeah. at our inaccuracies and, uh, and our customers give us that feedback. The second thing is we are an extension of our customers in many ways. We're a third party that they need to trust. And so as a security person, we have to really ensure that they can, we can keep that trust with them. It's really hard to gain, uh, exceptionally easy to lose those, uh, those trusts. And, and so they think about us in a, in a time of, uh, of duress, in many cases with a cribble. Um, we're a lights on, doors open style company. We need to be there when they're dealing with their crisis. They need us more than ever. What, how much of your time is spent external uh, with customers getting dragged around by the sales team versus sort of protecting it, you know, Cribble. It's interesting. I think a lot of it's a thought leadership opportunity for, for me, and I'm learning so much interacting with our customers that I'm maybe selfishly bringing a lot of the things that I get from them right back home. Um, I'm splitting my time a fair bit, um, but right now I have such an amazing team. I know that I can have a lot of those, uh, those members there just backing me up. Um, but like I said, I, I gain so much. I feel like it's a, it'd be a disservice to our folks to not bring it back and share it with them and, uh, and run our team. There's a certain narrative in the industry around consolidation of tools. We all know there's tools creep. You hear the numbers, whether it's dozens or many, many dozens of tools on average installed. We did a survey with our partner ETR uh, down uh, right, right around RSA, just mm -hmm. before RSA. And we, one of the questions we asked was, uh, you know, are you able to, are you consolidating vendors in your security stack? Only 9% of the customers said yes. Now, am I shocked? Every practitioner I talked to, by the way, said, a and you're surprised <laughs> at that? I'm like, well, no, but I'm surprised that it was only 9%. Ironically, 
All the consolidators that I talked to said, no, 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 our data is different. Well, the data doesn't lie. Mm -hmm. And you know, right? I can see you're smiling because you know that it's really hard to consolidate. Now, of course, from your standpoint, from your company standpoint, it doesn't really matter, mm -hmm. right? I mean, more complexity is maybe better for you. Maybe not, doesn't really matter. Uh, but, but my question is not so much Cribble specific. It's why is, is it so hard to consolidate tools? Is it because you got to fill gaps and there's some I don't mean shiny to new toy as a pejorative. It's actually some new innovation that comes along that's actually really good that you say, okay, I'm going to apply that. Mm -hmm. Is that why, or there, is it just like inertia? What, what I, drives that? I, I would say the provocative way to response to respond to that would be like, well, the adversaries are not consolidating their tools. The adversaries are staying ahead of the curve. They are out there inventing new things. And guess what? They have the coolest stuff, the shiniest, newest stuff. They have access to it as well. And we have to be sure that we are thinking about where they're going and trying to stay ahead of them. Gen AI, all of these technologies, deep fake technologies, these are things that they can get as well. There's open source models out there that we're not restricting their access to. Not that we could restrict their access to. That's in, is that like a reverse judo move where you have to take the adversary's tool and then make sure you understand how they're going to use it so you can apply it to protect yourself? Yes, not only that, we sh in many cases are using them not against our employees, but we're showing them to our employees and interacting with our employee base, our population base, our constituents, whomever they are, and teaching them what to be on the lookout for. Because you might get a WhatsApp message or a text message or a video message from a friend or an audio message. Is it them? I don't know. Like now you really have to think about whether or not it's coming from them. These deep fakes, while some of them are absolutely hilarious and I'd love to watch the funny ones, a lot of them aren't hilarious and they're really traumatizing for some people to listen to. And people that are not uh, digital natives will continue to struggle there. Well, and, and it's election year. So obviously, you know, the term deep fakes, who with people who understand what that means is pretty scary. Do you think it will have a material impact uh, on the election? I know it's a hard question to answer, but is it is that is it prominent enough that and good enough that people will you know, fall for it? I, I don't know that I have an exact answer as to whether or not it's going to impact the election. I think that's a that's for experts that are well beyond my capacity. I, I'm I, not sure anybody can answer yes, that question. That's fair <laughs> as well. I would say, though, um, I've been impressed and impressed is a scary word to use with someone who's an adversary okay. to you um, with some of the things that I've seen um, in the market, things that I've, I've seen sent to me and shared to, with me with my internal team going, hey, this looks like, you know, you know, fake bat, fake, you know, a fake, uh, fake CEO or a, or a fake uh, CFO message. And uh, some of them are very interesting. And obviously there are uh, there have been instances where there was a, a very famous event on a video conference where a particular actor was uh, using a deep fake technology to uh, encourage someone to make a large bank transfer uh, to the tune of tens of millions of dollars. The number's all over the place, so we don't know exactly what those dollar amounts were. But that was a, a real event, a real negative event, a real negative event that brought in a deep fake technology. That was, uh, okay. And, and was that a phishing example? It, it, yeah, I think I was there, it, actually, it, after dark. <laughs> um, and, uh, okay. A little podcast set up. Yeah, that was, that was really yeah, interesting. It was, it was uh, uh, yeah, there, there's some pretty interesting, some interesting things. I'm actually meeting with yet another technology company next week um, who, again, we will go through that exercise. Um, we're all familiar with the, the concept of the face swap, uh, whether whatever social media application, that in and of itself is, is effectively become you know, real time for us. We can, uh, we can use, it, use it in good ways and bad ways. Just I mean, to add a little color, and then there, there was another example where this, this it was a you know, tape conversation, I mean, a, a, a simulated tape conversation, but it was like, hey, um, you know, I can't get into my password, and um, they had some information about the company, who's your manager, is this person? So they were able to convince the agent that they were who they were, and oh, I just I got a new phone, you know. Can you? And so, and they were able to talk their way into the system. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other example we saw is it was actually North Korean young people mm -hmm. applying for jobs, mm -hmm. getting laptops that were sent to a location that enabled hackers to. They call them laptop the farms. We have a word for it now. Or laptop phrase farms. For it. Explain that. Yeah. These are, uh, these are locations where um, companies who are think seemingly hiring someone who they think is going to do a job 
uh, typically it's a tech job. Typically uh, it's a lower skill job. They'll actually intentionally have the person be an underperformer, um, and then they will, you know, fake at the very last minute, change the address. Oh, actually, I need you to send it to uh, this street in, you know, in some town in, in some state. And then there will be a receiver or a mule who will actually take the laptop, set it up, and they'll install programs that keep your mouse moving so you're, it looks like you're working or your screensaver doesn't turn on. These are, these are networks of folks that are generating, whether it's knowledge of your company um, or they're generating money by you know, manipulating that machine in some way or trying to uh, ransom, ransom their way out. I used to, I mean, I've done security shows for a long, long time and it used to think about, okay, dwell time. They're in there for 360 days on average. Can we, can we compress that down to 200? Can we compress that down to 100? And it, it's become so irrelevant now as a metric because mm -hmm. um, you got breakout times that are you know, measured in minutes. Um, what else is changing in cyber? It's such a fast changing dynamic. Obviously ransomware has taken off. What are the other things that we should be paying attention to, maybe as a result of, of AI or other you know, items that people might not be as familiar with? So a couple of things, to the dwell time you know, comment, the, you know, we really uh, aren't measuring it the same way we were because of uh, the speed at which we need to operate. And, the, and to increase some of those speeds, you know, we're trying to remove some of the guardrails around people to be able to build their own, whether it's infrastructure to solve a problem or build their own um, you know, capabilities and capacities, reducing, again, reducing a lot of those, those, those noises that are coming in and trying to make those much more, uh, you know, much more critical decision faster for us. Um, and so I think that's a, that's a big forefront for us. And then uh, the other one is we're working with Gen AI capabilities to reduce some of the challenges that some of the earlier operators, so some of the people that have just joined our firm, maybe it's an intern you know, turned over and she's just got there and now we have to teach her this whole syntax. Well, isn't it a great opportunity for us to leverage a Gen AI to generate the syntax on her behalf? And she can just enter in the questions she wants to interrogate the data with and she can generate those questions it then spins those things off. That's just not code generation, but this is just allowing people to interact with systems as though I'm here as your peer, and we just sit side by side and just try to, you know, stop the stop the bad stop the bad guys together. I think that's a real big advent for us. So, if I ask the CISO pre-COVID, even during COVID, what's your what's your number one challenge? Typically, the answer I get back is we just don't have enough talent in the organization. Is that still the number one challenge? We don't have enough people. Um, I think in many cases we need people with the right mindsets. We don't need people with necessarily all those skills. I think we now uh, are at a point where the technology themselves can help us enable the people that are good people that are interested in doing these things. We still have a shortage. Um, whether there's job opening shortages or whether there's people to fill those job shortages, that seems to be quite a debate at the minute. Um, I, uh, I think I could, if you gave me 10 more people tomorrow, um, I'd find really good work for them to do and have a very positive impact, but recognizing businesses, uh, you know, businesses have different challenges and trying to approach them requires us to adapt and, uh, and adjust. Bad human behavior beats good security every time. So I, I want you to talk to the ROI of good, strong training and a, a strong security culture. Well, uh, as you well know, this is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, October, my right. favorite month of the year, yours yeah. too, we were talking Absolutely. about earlier. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, one way to do this is to remove some of the stigma for people tripping up, uh, especially if we are the ones doing a simulation against them. Let's start to reward our staff, our people, the people that we work with, to make good choices. And how can we do that? There's a million ways you can do that. It could be giving somebody a mug with a thank you, you know, cybersecurity of the day person or whatever the case may be. It could be compensating them differently. There's a lot of different approaches to it, but I think the, it starts with us removing the stigma attached with people that will fall for a, a trick or something along those lines. If you have a knowledge worker, there's an opportunity to make them better. And the folks that fall below the line, let's work on training with them. Let's make that training unique and interesting, uh, interesting for them. Let's hear what's next for Cribble. We will uh, we'll see you probably at reInvent. That's, uh, that's an amazing as a person who has not gone many times, I am floored uh, with the past few times I've been there with just the amount of people and the energy there. Um, you know, getting with those developer community, that engineering community is going to be critical for us. Obviously, IT and, our, and security are our people. They're my people. I came out of IT and moved into security, so they're my people as well. Uh, getting with them and seeing what the next, uh, what, where, where their challenges are. 
think just showing them, making them aware that Kribble exists, I think that's going to be a, a critical thing for us and a great opportunity. Great. Mike, thanks so much thanks, for Steve. coming to theCUBE. Cheers. Great to see you. Good to see you. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest right after this short break. You're watching theCUBE plus NYSE Wired, our CXO series from the New York Stock Exchange.